if you look over the course of decades, the outcome studies using nuclear stress testing was in a range of two to three years. But recently, we've had an increasing interest and focus on looking at the long-term outcomes following stress testing. And this is important because it could help us determine new therapies that might be necessary to decrease long-term risk. So this was the goal of our study. I am Dr. Alan Rosansky, Director of Nuclear Cardiology at Mount Sinai Morningside Hospital in New York City. I'm pleased to report today on a new study that will be published at Mayo Clinic Proceedings. The paper is entitled, Comparative Predictors of Mortality Risk Among Contemporary Patients Referred for Stress Myocardial Perfusion Imaging. So this particular paper is about stress testing. Stress testing has been employed in the United States for over six decades. Uh, most commonly today, we use it with uh, assessment of wall motion, such as with stress echocardiography, or looking at myocardial blood flow using either SPECT or PET myocardial perfusion imaging. The test is used primarily for two reasons. One, to assess patients' likelihood of having obstructive coronary artery disease, and the other is to assess patients' risk for future cardiac events. Traditionally, the test has been used as a point of care uh, tool to help decide to, uh, does, a patient's, does a patient's symptoms due to ischemia, does the patient need cardiac catheterization, does the patient need revascularization. And as a consequence, the follow-up of these patients has generally been over a short-term period of time. Uh, in our particular study, we evaluated over 15,000 patients who came in for nuclear stress testing, stress myocardial spec perfusion imaging, at Cedar sinai Medical Center for clinical indications. We followed these patients up for a mean of about seven years, looking for the occurrence of all cause of mortality. We assessed extensive data in these patients, more than any prior study looking at stress testing. We collected all the relevant clinical data, the risk factors they had, and also assessed patients' comorbidities, which generally has not been assessed before, including whether they had coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, atrial fibrillation, chronic kidney disease or stroke. We evaluated the patients for ischemia, and we also evaluated patients in terms of how they perform during exercise testing. Were they able to perform treadmill exercise, or they, did they need pharmacological stress testing because of a contraindication to stress testing, such as having physical deconditioning, having an orthopedic issues, or other uh, miscellaneous reasons why they couldn't undergo exercise testing. So there were some uh, very expected findings we found that there was an increase in mortality rate in a stepwise fashion with increasing number of coronary risk factors. We found that there was a stepwise increase in mortality rates with increasing number of comorbidities. And in fact, when you combine them together, the greater the magnitude of comorbidities or risk factors together, the greater the patient's mortality risk. All of this is not surprising. The next thing we did, however, is we divided the patients in those, into those who could perform exercise testing and those who required pharmacological stress testing. And what we found was that among the exercise patients, there was no stepwise increase in risk according to the number of risk factors and comorbidities. In fact, across the board, if patients could exercise, their mortality rate was less than 1% per year. All of the concentrated risk was in the pharmacological patients. First of all, a patient requiring pharmacological stress testing has a, about a two-fold increase or more of uh, mortality risk compared to an exercise patient. But then this was all magnified in these patients according to the number of risk factors or comorbidities. So what are the implications of these findings? First, let me hasten to say that this is observational data. So we can't say that good exercise capacity, in fact, was the cause of the low mortality rate in these patients, because this is just observational data. However, the data are so striking that it does indeed suggest a very strong protective effect that being able to exercise has among patients referred for cardiac stress testing. Now, uh, this data is highly consistent with a lot of research that has been published over the years. These data have important implications for the imaging doctors who perform these tests, because traditionally you've focused on the amount of ischemia that patients has and really reported results more in a reductionist fashion, reporting risk in terms of how much ischemia a patient has. But you can't ignore that the fact that whether a patient exercises or not is a key vital sign. 
and it is incumbent upon us when we integrate all the clinical data together to report that patients who have risk factors and can't exercise, even in the absence of ischemia, have substantial increased long-term risk. Now, reporting these results to the doctors would serve as an important incentive for the doctors to have shared conversations with their patients to understand that the test may have been normal in terms of lack of ischemia, but there is a concern if the patient is in fact not able to exercise and has risk factors that there ought to be things that patients should think about doing. Now this coincides at a time when it has never been easier for doctors to counsel patients. And this is because beginning in 2018, with the publication of the second edition of the physical activity guidelines, exercise guidelines for Americans, it was noted based on new accelerometer data that any amount of the physical activity that a patient performs improves their health. Even if someone parks further away from a uh, store or does a walking errand or climbs stairs instead of taking an escalator, these are things that are promoting your health and we have data to show that. So now if you, inclu you include the circle here, we report the results of all the factors, not just a scheme at the time of testing. Doctors have shared conversations with the patients if they can't exercise. And they can encourage patients to say, look, I know you're sedentary, but could you intentionally agree to walk five minutes a day? The patient might be incredulous that a small amount of physical activity might be helpful, but in fact, this is the track for decreasing patients' long-term risk for cardiac events. So there's much more in this paper that we've published, and I hope you'll read it and take a look at it on Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Thank you. We hope that you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel, www.youtube.com Mayo Proceedings, or journal updates on Facebook, www.facebook dot com Mayo Clinic Proceedings. You can also follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter, available at Mayo Proceedings. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research, published by Elsevier Incorporated. All rights are reserved, including those for text and data mining, AI training, and similar technologies.